All right, you were just watching Jennifer Crumbly's involuntary manslaughter trial as it continues. Yeah, thanks for joining us today. And welcome to CBS News Detroit at 5. I'm Shana Humphreys. And I'm Terrence Friday. This was day five of the trial for Jennifer Crumbly, and it included bombshell testimony from a man who admitted to having an affair with her. We continue our coverage tonight with our legal panel who have been watching since this morning and all along during this trial. We've got defense attorneys Rick Convertino and Lillian Diallo. So we have to start with this bombshell development today. Uh, <laughs> We are now aware that one of the men we heard from on the stand today is a man who Jennifer Crumbly was having an affair with at the time of the shooting. Just a month ago, we were covering the news that the defense did not want this information shared in court. And then lo and behold, today, the defense attorney brings it up. Uh, Rick, if you could go over the importance of this affair to the case and also the extraordinary development of the defense attorney bringing it up. Well, it is extraordinary. It was astonishing, actually, to hear it. The judge pointed out that uh, to the defense attorney when it was brought up by her in front of the jury, no less, um, that uh, they had had a previous hearing 18 months ago regarding this specific, this specific issue and that the defense attorney fought hard to keep this evidence out of, out of trial. There's a good reason for that, Shane. The reason is character evidence or uh, bad character evidence is, is very damaging and prejudicial to a defendant. And the law precludes it from coming in unless there's some good reason, some relevant reason that outweighs the, 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 probe, uh, the, the prejudicial value. In this case, the judge ruled to exclude the evidence. Today, 18 months later, the defense attorney, kind of sua sponte, um, seemed very emotional and not well thought out, said, I want this in, and I don't care if you bring a wheelbarrow full of uh, evidence about extramarital affairs. Is that something you would typically consult with the client about before? It, it seemed that the defense attorney herself decided this is fair game now. Did yeah. she consult with the defendant? That's an excellent question. In fact, um, we were pointing out at the break that uh, and she should definitely, not only will the judge uh, ask the defense attorney, are you sure, which she did, but the judge in this case swore under oath the defendant and asked the defendant directly, are you sure this is how you want to proceed? This is damaging evidence, and um, for the purposes of appeal, the judge wanted to protect the, uh, the, um, um, the record, and the prosecutor was adamant about having a hearing outside the presence of the jury to protect the record and ensure that the defendant was wanted to go along with what her attorney was doing. The defendant did agree and said, yes, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm desirous of moving ahead with this, this um, evidence of an affair. So. It's, it's uh, mind-boggling, astonishing. There's no legal reason that I could come up with that the defense attorney would want to switch uh, gears so quickly. Not only switch gears, they weren't, they weren't, it wasn't a slight issue. It was a 180-degree mm -hmm. reversal upon which they fought hard to keep out. Yeah, there have been a lot of jaw-dropping moments since yeah, this trial have. started. Today was certainly, Lillian, one of the biggest ones. This was one of the hardest days and hardest times to watch as a defense attorney, right? We know how we're trained. We know what's trained in us. There are things that are forced errors. And now understand, um, Madam Defense Attorney, we are um, sisters in arms, so to speak. However, sometimes we're holding th different things, right? And I don't want to knock her unnecessarily, but she has got to stop forcing errors in this particular trial. She has to be concerned about her client and for her not to even talk to her client and go off of the fly and say, my client is okay with it. The judge pumped the brakes and said, no, we're gonna place her under oath, right? You're making a, such a big deal out of nothing, right? There's nothing you gain from that other than now we know at least one of the people that Jennifer had an affair with and what did you gain out of that? They go to Costco, they do everything. And it made Jennifer seem more narcissistic because it's all about her. Madam defense attorney needs to kind of change that tone some, right? I don't care about her having a flippant personality or whatever. We're talking about four children that died at the hands of your son with a gun that you knew he had. She's told at least three lies that we know of, right? One, the son's friend is dead. Two, the gun is in my car right now. Three, the gun was locked up with a cable lock, and I think she called it something different, right? We know those three things are not true. So she has a penchant for making things seem better for her and all about 
her. And four, she had made it seem as if she had a really tight schedule and had to get back to work. So just in terms of and protocol, five, though. Five, excuse me. She said she was unaware of his uh, mental oh. This mental illness. Mm -hmm. And just speaking in terms of protocol, Rick, how unusual is it for your defense attorney to get up and say something that is so damaging to your character? Oh, it's. Ex I mean, I've never, I've never heard it happen before, and you know, I've had hundreds of trials, and I've seen hundreds of, of trials as well. I've never seen anyone act this way in court, um, but it's consistent with what we've seen a couple of days ago. There's an exhibit. It's, uh, I think, it's exhibit, uh, uh, government exhibit. Uh, 431, which was an exhibit of 2,000 individual pages of text messages, Facebook posts, um, records that the defense uh, filed motions to have redacted. And then you'll recall, I know Terrence, you were here uh, during the trial, uh, when the defense attorney said, you know what, again, sua sponte, out of the blue, um, I want it all in. I want the redactions removed. Um, so everything she fought hard to to get redacted and precluded from uh, being seen by the jury, 180 degrees, right in the middle of trial, saying, nope, I changed my mind, my client's okay with it, we're going to let it roll. And you're going to see that stuff come in um, in, in spades in, in the closing argument by the prosecution. Which begs the question, what is the angle? What is the actual argument on the part of the defense? Because the prosecution is painting a very vivid picture. You mentioned narcissism, Lillian. Uh, she appeared to be, the defendant appeared to be cutting her losses with her son, the shooter, saying his she life's did. over. I need to worry about myself now. Right. Uh, Lillian, what is the argument on the part of the defense attorney? Because they're cross-examining these witnesses, and I'm not sure I'm understanding the point she's trying to make. Um, I don't know if anybody is understanding that point at all, right? I think she's, she needs to just take a step back and a breath because nothing that was presented that she wanted presented helps her. When somebody is saying, oh, oh remember this is part of a motion that you filed to keep it out, you step back and go, okay, that's right, or, or whatever. Ask for a break if that's what you need. Don't sit there in the middle of somebody cross-examining something that you let in, examining rather, something that you let in and say, my internet is not working. I, stop it. I mean, it's so distracting, and I'm not against her, but I'm against that kind of behavior representing clients. I, I think one of the things that she's trying to do, and it's not really a legal uh, argument, uh, more of a personal uh, argument in front of the jury to get um, gain credibility, if you will, and tell, telling the jury or signaling to the jury, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, transparent. And so we're not... Um, going to try to block any evidence. We're, we're going to let it let it fly, and we're going to we're going to defend on it. I think that's what she's doing. Um, there's no other explanation for allowing in or for for seeking the admission of evidence that you fought so hard to keep out and were granted. So it's it's baffling. It was also kind of shocking to see her demeanor afterwards. You know, saying, "Oh, everyone has affairs. You know, no big deal." Right. Uh, and also, we can see that this is now overshadowed pretty much everything else that played out today. This is the one main thing that a lot of people are talking about. That's correct. And the, the man that testified, the firefighter captain, right, um, I, I know he was taken aback by the whole thing coming out, right, because he has a wife. We don't know if he has a family. I'm testifying here, and here you go. I had assurances, and now we're talking about an affair. What does that have to do with what the mother knew when the mother knew it? Her character, whatever's going on, is not relevant to not one of those involuntary manslaughter charges. Get back to the gross negligence and trying to knock that out of this whole involuntary manslaughter thing instead of adding to it. You're giving it to them. If they didn't have it before, well, I think they got it now. And like we pointed out earlier, had she not pointed that out, we wouldn't have seen that in the messages right. that were presented. I think one of the most damning pieces of evidence um, in this whole trial came out today through Milaj, the last witness, when during the course of text messaging, uh, the defendant text messaged him right away before, before she went to the school. She said, I'm, I, I'm being requested to go to the school, and here's why she sends him the, the, the math uh, test uh, drawing that Ethan did, or the shooter did, um, she said, I think he's going to do something dumb, which, which is a precursor to actually what happened. So she had knowledge that, that he was so far disturbed, so in, in, enthroned in, in this mental, um, this psychotic break, that, that he could, in fact, do something dumb. 
um, and there was a discussion between the two about a gun. Milaj said um, it, he, he was surprised. He didn't think that was a good idea to purchase a gun for him. So all of that, I think, was very damaging uh, to the pro uh, pardon me to the defense. We also saw that uh, Crumbly, the defendant, seemed to blame the school and all the school staff. How could they let this happen? I can't believe they gave him the option to go back to school, even though she, as the parent, had the option to take him from the school. Could that work in her favor at all? Just convincing the jury that she truly believed that someone else would let her know no. if there was an issue? No, because she knew about that gun and she knew about what happened before. Right? She knew about the predisposition of her child. Yeah. No, no, and no. Yeah. All right, and we're going to continue our team coverage with everything that has played out today. We're going to check in with Andres Gutierrez, who is at the Oakland County Circuit Court. Andres. Yeah, so in a nutshell, what did happen today, there was a bombshell testimony coming this afternoon from that man who had an affair with Jennifer Crumbly, who you guys have been discussing all afternoon long. We did, in fact, hear from her. She had to swear in and say that uh, she does, in fact, give permission that, to let the jurors know about the nature of that relationship. Uh, the day of the shooting, Crumbly messaged Brian Maloche that she had to go to the uh, son's school for a meeting, that she was afraid that he was might be do something stupid. He also testified about deleted messages between him and Jennifer. Now, going into this trial, as you pointed out, the defense kept asking to keep the affair out, but because there were those insinuations that Melosh had been intimidated by police, the affair became pivotal. Take a listen to this exchange. The council has alleged that two investigators with 30 years of experience have committed basically a crime by intimidating a witness and lying to a witness and that it, re it requires a strong and accurate response. This changes the entire case, Judge. I can't let that comment go without being correct. Okay, well, I, I don't know any of this information. You're, you're going to ask him, this witness, why he was protecting uh, her or why he um, didn't give full information to the police. We're not. We're not going to go off into Never Never Land and talk about uh, trips or you know, well, trips with other. him. Though trips with him when she said she was at work or using her her son as an excuse to go somewhere. No. Trips with him in particular, Judge. That goes to the heart of gross negligence and failure to adhere to your parental duty. That is a part of the case that we moved past when I the court issued the rule. About that. Your Honor, lots of people have. It was excluded. Don't don't have children that shoot up a school. That's not, that's not true. Now, earlier in the day, we did hear from an Oakland County Sheriff detective who said that hours after the attack, Crumbly told him that he's going to suffer, referring to her son. The detective also recounted how frustrated she was about sur uh, surrendering her phone. The ju jury also listened to details on how Crumbly and her husband were found hiding out at the art studio uh, on the city's east side. In fact, we the last witness that spoke today went over the photographic evidence that they collected there at the scene. Uh, the defense team claims they weren't fleeing, but this they were facing threats. So in total today, there were six witnesses. The prosecution there at the end said that they expect to do another one to four tomorrow, and they will anticipate, they're anticipating that the they will wrap up their case by lunch, and that in the afternoon, uh, we will hear from the defense. And again, that's the, 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 the key witness for them will be Jennifer Crumble herself, who we are expected to uh, see the, to her taking the stand. Reporting live in Pontiac, Andres Gutierrez, CBS News, Detroit. All right. Thank you very much, Andres. We also want to thank our attorneys, our legal panel who have been with us today, Rick Convertino and Lillian Diallo. Again, we will continue coverage as this trial goes on.